All right. When I first arrived to set up before the talk, uh, Neil Lawrence said, what's this guy doing here? He doesn't do Bayesian methods. And I imagine a lot of you are wondering the same thing. He, he was obviously joking. He knows why I'm here. Uh, there's a tradition at NIPS of having a single outsider come to each workshop. And while the organizers didn't explicitly tell me that I am that outsider, I, I think my lack of Bayesian credentials makes that pretty clear. So the role of the outsider in this tradition is to sometimes challenge some of the views of the community or to try to bring in ideas from the outside. And since I essentially believe in all of the goals of Bayesian deep learning, I won't really be here to challenge the community, but maybe to offer a few ideas for research directions from my own perspective, looking at adversarial machine learning. So I will speculate a little bit about three different topics where hopefully members of the audience have the right skills to execute on some ideas that I think could be very helpful both for adversarial machine learning and for Bayesian machine learning. Uh, the three basic ideas will be first about if we can build a generator network that can sample from the Bayesian posterior over parameters. Uh, second, if there are better adversarial ways of replacing um, the traditional approach to variational Bayes than we've been able to build so far. And finally, if Bayesian methods are able to solve the problem of adversarial examples in supervised learning. Uh, so first off, I should describe exactly what generative adversarial networks are in case anyone is not very familiar with them. The idea behind generative adversarial networks is that they're a particular approach to generative modeling. The idea of generative modeling is we have very many different samples and we would like to either fit a density function to those samples or we'd like to be able to generate more samples that come from the same distribution. Generative adversarial networks are primarily focused on the latter of these tasks, which I demonstrate with the images in the lower half of this slide. Generative adversarial networks are an approach to generative modeling based on a game played between two agents and each agent is a neural network in most applications. One of the agents is a generator network that learns to map unstructured noise to the data distribution. Uh, inputs are sampled from a prior distribution over a vector that we call Z. Z is essentially a latent description of the content of the example to be created. After applying a differentiable function G, that noise is transformed into something with structure that is ideally going to be a sample from the data distribution. The other player in this game is the discriminator network. The discriminator network is, again, a differentiable function that outputs a probability. And in this case, the probability is uh, an estimate of how likely it is that the input was real rather than fake, assuming that we sample real and fake examples with equal probability. During training, the discriminator is fed real examples, and it tries to output a probability close to one. And it is also fed fake examples from the generator, in which case it tries to output values close to zero. The generator tries to make the discriminator output values close to one. Uh, after both of these players are trained to do their tasks as best as possible, there is a Nash equilibrium that the players should approach in which the generator replicates the data distribution exactly. We can formulate this as a minimax game where the value function is just the likelihood for the binary classifier determining whether examples are real or fake. The equilibrium of the game is a saddle point that is a local maximum with respect to the um, discriminator and a local minimum with respect to the generator. There are other ways of developing this game, but this is the one that's the most amenable to theoretical analysis. The primary insight of generative adversarial networks is that this game causes the discriminator to estimate a ratio of densities. We can actually prove that uh, by taking the functional derivatives of the value function with respect to the discriminator function, that the optimal discriminator function should be this ratio p data of x over p data of x plus p model of x. We need to know this ratio in order to estimate a variety of different divergences, including the KL divergence that we minimize in order to do maximum likelihood learning. This essential approximation technique is the core of the generative adversarial method. It gives us a way of computing different divergences by using supervised learning to estimate this ratio. The key downsides to this approximation are that supervised learning can overfit or underfit. 
And the overall learning framework as a whole has a downside that the search for the equilibrium of the game can be difficult to carry out. So that contrasts with other methods like using Markov chains to estimate the gradient of intractable partition functions where the Markov chain might fail to mix. And it also contrasts with variational methods where the approximation is a lower bound on the log likelihood. So this is just one more approximation tool in our toolbox that we can use to solve different tasks. Overall, generative adversarial networks have become known for being able to produce high quality samples from very complicated distributions. I show here some cherry picked examples from samples of images from the ImageNet data set that were created by a generative adversarial network. And a lot of my ideas that I'll propose today are based on this idea that we can get really good samples from a distribution that might be hard to capture with some kind of analytical function. And the idea is essentially that some very difficult integrals that arise in Bayesian learning could benefit from sampling from these new forms of approximations to these complicated distributions. So the first speculative idea that I'll discuss is training a gener generator net to sample from the posterior distribution over parameters. There's one obvious practical obstacle to this approach, which is that if we want to take something like a deep neural network and we want to sample its parameters, we're needing to learn a generative model of a very, very, very high dimensional space. There are typically far more parameters than there are inputs. If we consider just a really small case, modeling MNIST, MNIST has 784 uh, dimensions in the image space, but even very small models of MNIST for classification have over a million parameters. So we were talking about generating samples in a space that is orders of magnitude larger. Uh, the good news is that the posterior distribution of the parameters might not be quite as complicated as the distribution is in the data space. And we've also seen that there are some models that are capable of generating points in parameter space in other contexts. Uh, recently, there was a paper called Hypernetworks from Google Brain, where low dimensional descriptions of uh, the way that models should be distributed were able to be unpacked into more complete distributions over, over parameter space for a completely instantiated model. So it seems like this practical hurdle might not be the most important thing. There is also a theoretical problem, though. If we wanted to apply generative adversarial networks in the naive way, where we just take the existing algorithm and use it to generate parameters, we would actually need to have positive examples of samples from the posterior over parameters. So we can't just take the existing framework and use it directly. Uh, we can think a little bit about how we might take the principle of density ratio estimation and use that to bootstrap the training process. And I don't have a complete answer here. I guess the goal of my talk is to get people thinking about this idea, and I can show you some of the alleys that I've walked down looking in this direction, but I have not actually reached a complete solution yet. One idea is that during uh, the sampling of different parameter values, we would like to have an estimate of the likelihood. We'd like to know P of the data set given a particular value of the parameters. And depending on the model that we're using, this value might be completely intractable. So one solution we can use is we could try to estimate this value using the discriminator network. Uh, if you construct the ratio uh, P of X given theta over P of X given theta star, we can actually compute that using the discriminator approach. Uh, the basic idea is that we can decompose this ratio as a product of several different ratios, where each ratio is the ratio of densities for a single example. If we contrast its density with a current chosen value of the parameters and the true uh, optimal value of the parameters. So if we assume that the optimal value of the parameters is actually going to generate the observed training data, then the training data gives us uh, samples of the x's in the denominator. And we can use those to train the discriminator. After we've trained the discriminator, we're actually able to estimate this ratio of densities that we need. So we can go ahead and compute these ratios, ideally in, in log space rather than actually as ratios here. There is the problem that the denominator is not actually what we'd like. We'd like the denominator to just be one. But there are different algorithms that we can use to sample from the space given an unnormalized estimate of the desired density. 
there are a few drawbacks to this approach. One of them is that we would need to re-optimize the discriminator every time we visit a new theta value. And another drawback to this approach is that the trivial version of just computing these ratios using a fixed discriminator will not actually give us uh, derivatives with respect to the parameters theta of the underlying model that we want to sample from. What we could do instead of that naive approach is we could actually build a computational graph describing the learning process of the discriminator, as is done in the recent unrolled GANs paper. And when we backpropagate through that learning process, we could actually get gradients through the learning process itself with respect to the parameters theta. So this might actually give us a way of getting gradients that we can then use to do something like uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo over the space of parameters and try to sample from the posterior in a very flexible way. Another area where I think that adversarial learning can have an important effect, and to some extent already has, is as something of a replacement for variational bays. So the way that I think of variational bays is we have some latent variable z, and we have a generative model, a, a directed model, that takes us from a sample in z space to a sample in x space, where x is the data. Variational bays works by constructing a lower bound on the log likelihood. This lower bound is based on introducing an approximate distribution q over the latent variable z. And we can then write down this tractable lower bound that we can maximize with gradient-based methods. The main limitation of this approach is that the expressivity of q can limit the fidelity of the bound and, and also just limits the fidelity of our approximation to the true posterior. So one idea that we've had since we first introduced the generative adversarial nets paper is that we could actually use a generator net to obtain an approximation of the posterior that has arbitrary capacity. Uh, if we look at the structure of the generator network, it, it has a neural network mapping from the input noise to the output samples. And both that generation function and the PDF that it induces uh, have the universal approximator property. So with a larger and deeper net, we could become arbitrarily close to approximating any posterior distribution that we would like. The way that this would work is we would actually have two different generator networks. One of them is the generator network that maps from the latent space Z to the input space X. And then we would actually have to introduce some auxiliary variables that give us an extra source of noise. We build a second generator network that does the backwards mapping, where we take X and the auxiliary variables U and run them through a neural network that then gives us a sample from the space of Z given X. In principle, we could train this network to recover the true posterior with arbitrary precision. The reason that this is easier to train than the case of a generator net that samples from the posterior distribution over parameters is that we can actually get Z and X pairs using the same trick as the wake sleep algorithm. We just sample Z from the prior and then sample X from the distribution Z given X. Um, so several different related variants of this idea have already been built, but all of them have a few limitations compared to the vision that we're hoping can eventually be built. The first of these was the adversarial autoencoder by Ali Maxani and his collaborators, including myself. The basic idea of this was to not entirely replace the variational Bayes framework, but actually to continue using the variational lower bound to train the decoder, meaning the section that maps from Z to X. We trained only the um, X to Z mapping using a variational, using an adversarial criterion. We did have several limitations compared to the overall goal though. Rather than using an encoder that was augmented with extra random variables and that has the universal approximator property, we used a restricted encoder that, that is limited to a set of um, analytically describable distributions instead of anything that a, a neural net can produce for us. The other limitation of the adversarial autoencoder is that we step back a little bit from the really ambitious task of training a conditional generator net. So if we wanted to fully implement this idea where we have both X and U and we sample from Z, what we'd really like to do is train this conditional generator where we condition on X, we use U as a source of randomness, and we generate a sample from P of Z given X. Uh, 
and the discriminator would then need to look at both X and Z and see if those are compatible with each other. At the time that we wrote the adversarial autoencoder paper, we didn't yet feel that we were able to handle that kind of conditional generation task in this space. So what we actually did was we made the aggregate variational posterior have samples that were indistinguishable from the prior over Z, which isn't really quite the right thing to do, but it was actually easier to get the experiments to work out. Uh, later, other work moved on to actually doing the conditional uh, sampling approach where the discriminator actually looks at both Z and X to determine if they're compatible rather than just real. There were two different papers that were published at around the same time that both implement more or less the same idea. One of them is called Adversarially Learned Inference by Vincent Dumoulin and his collaborators, and the other one is called uh, Bygans by Jeff Donahue and his collaborators. Uh, one of these uses an encoder that maps to a Gaussian distribution, and the other one has a deterministic encoder that maps to a single point. But both of them are working on this basic idea of having an encoder that samples from the posterior. And they aren't yet to the point where they can make arbitrary samples with an unrestricted generator net. They still assume that there's a specific functional form where you can easily evaluate the PDF of the posterior. But I think that uh, removing that restriction could lead to really nice, highly flexible approximations to the posterior, where we could essentially sample almost from the true thing. Uh, the third idea I'd like to describe is resisting the challenge of adversarial examples. The basic idea of an adversarial example is that if we have a machine learning classifier, we can choose worst case inputs that easily fool that classifier. In this example, I show an image of a panda on the left. This was classified by Googlenet with 58% confidence as being a panda. If we then use the gradient and use a simple update rule to figure out how we can fool this model, we obtain this image in the middle. It looks like noise, but it's actually carefully structured using uh, the gradient. And if we add just a little tiny bit of this noise, scaled down to the point that it doesn't actually change the 8-bit representation of the pixels, it changes only the 32-bit representation that is actually fed to the model. We obtain an image that on the monitor still looks exactly the same because we're only displaying eight bits of brightness for each pixel. But the network now classifies this as being a gibbon with 99% confidence. So we obtained an incorrect prediction with very high confidence. We know that part of what's going on is that when we train with maximum likelihood, the model is encouraged to assign as high of confidence as possible to all of the different training examples. There isn't really much of anything in the process asking it to scale down its confidence at all. And we also find that the model is able to fit the training set with very linear functions. If we then sweep out a track in input space, where in this grid on the left, as you move from left to right, top to bottom, we sweep from uh, subtracting a large perturbation from an image to the original image itself right here. It's an image of a white car and a red background. To As we move to the far lower right, we're looking at what happens when we add this perturbation. We're, we're essentially sweeping out a linear track in pixel space. So those pixel coordinates are plotted over here on the x-axis. The unnormalized log probabilities computed by the network are shown on the y-axis here. And we see that they all move in these v-shaped tracks where they're uh, piecewise linear functions with very large pieces. And we get this uh, undesirable linear extrapolation property, where as we move very far from the data, we actually get very large responses in the model. And it becomes extremely confident in ways that we wouldn't actually like. I think that uh, Bayesian learning could actually improve this problem a lot. And in particular, designing different priors over the spaces that we use to infer uh, the, the class identity of, of these inputs could help quite a lot. So if we think through a simple example where we're trying to distinguish between uh, two different classes, we could imagine what happens if we use uh, a distribution where each class is assumed to have a Gaussian shape, and what happens if we assume that each class is assumed to have some kind of heavy tails to it. Uh, in both cases, if we look at the data distribution, in this example, we've just assumed that the data is distributed according to this bimodal shape. If we then fit uh, the Gaussian distribution to it, the, the mixture of two Gaussians to it, and look at the posterior over the Gaussian mixture, we find that the confidence 
that the Gaussian mixture assigns to the, the uh, class with ID 1 is extremely high as we move far to the right. And uh, we're extremely confident that that class is not present as we move very far to the left. This doesn't necessarily fit with what human intuition would say to do or what we might want to have happen in a wide range of engineering applications. The data has mostly appeared here in the middle of the plot, but the model is most confident over at the edges. Uh, by changing the assumptions that we use to model the data w by saying that we think that each component should have heavy tails, we can actually obtain a different distribution where the, the entropy over the two, uh, the two mixture components is very high as we move off to the sides. I think that using Bayesian techniques to put these kinds of priors into the decision functions that we learned with neural networks could cause them to have much better estimates over the posterior distribution over classes. We see in practice that RBF models work much better than linear models for uh, resisting adversarial examples. So in this demonstration, I take two different models, and in each case, I begin a process with an image of a nine from the MNIST training set. And I then follow the gradient of the probability of different classes in order. As we move from left to right, top to bottom, we take more and more gradient steps. Every time we see a yellow box, we were able to successfully transform the input into a different class. So we begin with this image of a nine and we gradually transform it into what the linear model believes is a zero. And then we transform it some more and we get what the linear model believes is a one, a two, a three, and so on. And the only image that actually looks correct for the linear model is the nine at the lower right. But the only reason that one looks correct is that we started with a nine. In the image on the right, I show what happens when we follow the same process with a shallow RBF model. We start off with a nine, and then we, we turn it into something that looks like a zero. We're not actually able to get it classified as being a zero with high confidence, so we give up and we move on to making it be classified as a one, and so on. In this case, we never actually get an extremely high confidence that we've hit the targeted class, but you can see that we actually change the appearance of the input to resemble each of the different classes. It's more robust to this gradient-based attack procedure than the linear model is. So there's a few different ways that we might be able to use Bayesian models besides just thinking about uh, what the distribution over the posterior over different mixture components should look like. One is we could just take a Bayesian neural network and hope that integrating over many different possible values of the parameters could give us uh, better, uh, better confidence estimates over the classes. I have tried this a little bit, but I'm not really an expert on Bayesian neural networks, so I wouldn't necessarily assume that I've, I've done a competent job of it, and hopefully someone in the audience can do a much better job of it than I have. I've tried two basic techniques, one where I introduce a variational posterior over the parameters, and another one uh, based on Uren's work using uh, Monte Carlo dropout. In both cases, the problem was mitigated somewhat, but didn't really come very close to being solved, that I could reduce the confidence that uh, was assigned to adversarial examples, but I could not actually cause the correct class to become the argmax. Uh, another thing that you could do is you could actually train a Bayesian model that correctly decreases its confidence as you move farther from the data, some kind of Gaussian process or something like that. And you could train the neural network to emulate that model. The essential idea here is that some of these Bayesian models can be relatively slow to run at test time. The neural network is fast to run at test time, but assigns its confidence values in incorrect ways. If we could shape the neural net to map the more rational model, then we could obtain the benefit of fast inference at test time while still resisting adversarial examples. If we're able to overcome the problem of adversarial examples, then I think we will be able to do much better at uh, model-based optimization. To get people more excited about the relatively dry idea of, well, the dry sounding idea of model-based optimization, I like to refer to this as the universal engineering machine or the automatic inventor. The basic idea is that if we have a neural net that looks at designs of objects, such as blueprints for cars, and it predicts how well those objects will perform, for example, predicting how fast the car will go, then we can ideally use gradient descent with respect to the input to this model to find better and better cars. Unfortunately, with the adversarial example problem we have right now, neural networks are not actually going to give you 
ideal objects if you use gradient descent on their input. They usually give you adversarial examples that are believed by the network to be highly likely to be good, but in practice are often uninteresting. So I think if we're able to come up with a really solid solution to the adversarial example problem, we'll be able to have much more powerful model-based optimization techniques. And we'll be able to apply them to lots of different tasks like CPU design, drug discovery, and uh, design of genes that, that correspond to enzymes that have properties that we'd like. Uh, so in conclusion, I think that generative adversarial nets may be able to sample from the Bayesian posterior over parameters and may be able to give us a way to sample from arbitrarily high capacity approximations to the posterior over latent variables in the variational Bayes framework. I also think that Bayesian learning might be able to help us solve the adversarial example problem and unlock the true potential of model-based optimization with deep neural nets. Are there, any, are there any questions? Cool. Um, in that case, I'm going to ask a question. Okay. Um, if you looked at uh, model uncertainty for the adversarial setting, whether you have increased increased uncertainty when sorry, whether you have increased uncertainty with the adversarial examples. Uh, you're referring to the uncertainty over the parameters. Uh, predictive uncertainty. <laughs> Pre predictive predictive uncertainty. Oh yeah. So uh, if we actually train in a model with adversarial training where we train on adversarial examples as well as clean examples. We're still just using a maximum likelihood criterion, but applied to these adversarial examples, the confidence estimates become better. So can, let's, oh, we have another question. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say um, to your last bullet point about uh, adversarial, using Bayesian approaches to deep learning neural networks to address adversarial examples. Um, we've also tried it. I, I was very hopeful that just sprinkling a little bit of Bayes would get you the right error bars and you'd become a bit, you know, I was hope <coughs> hopeful you'd become a lot more robust to adversarial examples. And what we found was you do become a bit more robust to adversarial examples, so that's promising, but, but they don't go away um, so this is quite similar to what you found. So something in the structure, probably in the linearity of how um, deep neural nets are usually defined is, is as you say, also you know, kind of consistent with the failure to get around those and get better uncertainty estimates. But uncertainty in, in neural nets is obviously sort of very central to this workshop and I think a lot of us are passionate about getting them to be more honest about their uncertainty somehow or calibrated. Yeah, I think it's one of the next big frontiers that we're very good at getting the right argmax, but not good at getting the right distribution yet. Um, let's thank the speaker again.